Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Lisa Davis. Lisa is the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Blue Shield of California, a nonprofit health plan with over $20 billion in annual revenue, serving more than 4 million members in the state's commercial, individual, and government markets. Prior to her role at Blue Shield, Lisa served as a Vice President and General Manager at Intel Corporation. In this interview, Lisa talks about Blue Shield's mission of transforming the healthcare industry through balancing high tech with high touch aligning the IT organization around portfolios and products, and engaging with the multiple stakeholders of Blue Shield. She also shares the lessons of authentic leadership, advantages of her experience as a CIO across different industries, advice for CIOs who wish to join boards as she has, increasing diversity and inclusion in STEM fields, and the latest tech trends she's excited about in healthcare. If you enjoy Technovation, please consider reading my new book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book is available now on Amazon or wherever else you buy books. As a special offer to our CXO listeners, if you purchase 50 or more books for you and your team, I'd be delighted to join your team for a group discussion on it. To learn more, write us at information at metastrategy.com or visit gettingtonimble.com. Thank you. Lisa Davis, welcome to Technovation. It's wonderful to speak with you today. Thank you, Peter. Happy to be here. Excellent. Well, Lisa, you are the uh, Chief Information Officer of Blue Shield of California. And I wonder for those people who are listening who may be less familiar with your business, could you please take a couple of minutes and just provide a little context as to what Blue Shield of California does? Yes, uh, happy to. First, I joined Blue Shield of California in February of 2020, um, right before we went into the pandemic, unfortunately. But Blue Shield of California is an 82-year-old nonprofit. It was actually founded in 1938. We have 20 billion in annual revenue. And we have a 2% pledge where Blue Shield voluntarily caps its net income at 2% of revenue. So we have returned more than $560 million to our customers and communities as a result. Uh, since 2002, Blue Shield has contributed to that foundation for nonprofit organizations to ultimately strengthen health safety and address and prevent domestic violence. We serve 4.5 million members in California. And our mission is to create a healthcare system that is worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable. What a great overview and, and, and highlighting uh, the, the way in which the organization does good in multiple ways. Thank you for that. Lisa, um, uh, as you and I have, have talked about in the past, as somebody who has held the chief information officer role in multiple organizations, they that translates differently organization by organization. Talk a bit about what's within your purview as CIO of Blue Shield of California, please. Yeah, so absolutely. I run uh, the overall information technology organization that also includes our data and analytics organization. Uh, certainly set the strategic direction um, and vision for the technology organization and how we support our mission at Blue Shield of California. So very exciting about the role that I play uh, and the impact that we can have on transforming healthcare. And, and talk a bit of, a bit about that strategic direction uh, that you help lead. What are some of the areas that you and your organization are focused on currently? Yeah, we believe at Blue Shield California, Peter, that the healthcare system today is broke. Um, and frankly, our uh, vision and our mission is to transform that healthcare system. And we think about creating a different member experience and ultimately improving health outcomes uh, for all of our members. And those pillars are around having a personalized experience having a more holistic experience and creating an experience that is high tech as well as high touch. And we certainly know um, within the efforts of digital transformation that healthcare has been more of a laggard. One of the things that the pandemic has brought is really thrusted the healthcare sector to the forefront of the need for digital uh, transformation, and frankly, to meet in the needs of our consumers um, and what they expect from a healthcare system that is holistic, personalized, and high tech and high touch around digital. And I'd be interested, especially you mentioned a moment ago that you you joined uh, 
just as the pandemic was roiling and 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 a lot of your onboarding no doubt happened post pandemic i'd love to get into that in a moment but i no doubt the all that has transpired in the past 12 13 14 months uh, has also impacted what high tech, high touch means. I, I, at times, high touch being very different, even the ability to to touch and to to be in the same physical room with with the patients uh, can be compromised or at least changed. And no doubt, that's uh, that 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 mix of high tech versus high touch, that degree of personalization that includes a digital component to it. I imagine there have been you know new ways of thinking about that in light of all that's transpired in, in, across the past year. Is that is that safe to say? Oh, you know, absolutely, Peter. You know, a great example of that is telehealth. You know, probably prior to the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of consternation or certainly belief that telehealth wasn't wanted by consumers, wouldn't be leveraged or used by our members. And in fact, the pandemic showed just the opposite. Uh, Telehealth has soared almost 500%. Uh, We're actually seeing better health outcomes, and we're seeing that our members actually prefer telehealth appointments to having to go into the office. So I think there's lots of lessons that, frankly, the pandemic has taught us Mm -hmm. of where and how we should be thinking about delivering capability, delivering options and services that are digital Uh, to provide ultimately a better experience for our members, as well as a better health outcome. We also know as we think about our health in general, 80% of that is determined outside of our genetics from our environment. So when we think about that holistic experience, that's the ability to bring all of these data sets together to ultimately share data, have data interoperability, which has always been difficult to do within the healthcare space. And I think the pandemic has showed a need to drive our healthcare system into a digital ecosystem. And this is the time for a technical revolution in in healthcare. If there is any benefit that we can derive from what we have all endured living through this pandemic, it's leveraging that to change the healthcare system for the better. So when we think about transforming that healthcare experience, we we call it health reimagined. And imagine where you have an experience where providers, members, and payers have access to the same data, that we're making decisions that are best for the member or the patient because you have all of the providers sharing information from a single electronic health record that we're making decisions based on all of this information that is holistic and personalized to that member. So ultimately they have that better experience on the outcome. So this experience cube, we call it, is ultimately what we are trying to create and bring to market in the next couple of years at Blue Shield of California. And that's fascinating, Lisa, and and certainly a compelling vision. The this digital transformation and and uh, leveraging data and analytics to to reimagine health, as you point out. Talk a bit about, if you would, some of the changes that have been necessary to the way in which IT is organized in order to bring that to life. No doubt, um, your ambitions and where the team stood, there may have been a bit of a, of a disconnect and a need to you know, retrain some people or advance the way in which some, some things were done. Can you talk a bit about some of the, the changes that, you, that you've made across the, the past year and change that you've been in role in order to truly have a team that can deliver what you've described? Yeah, absolutely. That foundational element of the role that the IT organization plays is absolutely critical to enable this type of experience uh, and the vision that we want to create of reimagining healthcare. Um, And currently, many times in the healthcare sector, the IT organization, just as it did at Blue Shield of California, played more of a back office role a service provider role in which the business would make decisions and kind of toss over the fence um, to the IT organization. And really the purpose of the IT organization, you know, traditionally is to keep the lights on, make sure that the network stays up. Our application, our applications have solid operational stability. 
uh, that we do those basics that I would call operational excellence. And one of the first things that I did coming into the organization and really understanding where our CEO, Paul Markovich, and our business wanted to create was to transform the IT organization into a new operating model that aligned around portfolios and products. So we spent the last year changing our operating model to align it against and support the key lines of business and key horizontal functions within the company. So now in a portfolio model, and we've created seven different portfolios, three to support lines of business, four to create horizontal functions such as Medicare, commercial business, senior markets, uh, customer care and marketing, corporate services would be a horizontal function, and a large complex horizontal function would be our health and growth solutions organization, which has a big need around data and analytics capability. So now we've aligned in a portfolio model that has customer facing, that is IT teams that support, that are customer facing, has a portfolio leader, a solution delivery lead, all the key functions of solution architects, business architects, security personnel, uh, data and analytics has been integrated into that portfolio so that not only is it allowing us to increase our business acumen, first and foremost, creating a basis of trust and foundation with our business partners to improve collaboration, um, understand the opportunities that the business is trying to solve, the capabilities that we're trying to bring to market so that those teams are connected hip to hip, working together to ultimately accelerate capability and services that we wanna to bring to market for our members. That has laid a foundation it's which we can now think of being a cloud and data company that is required to support this new digital experience and vision of health reimagined that we want for our members. How interesting. And as you mentioned uh, at the outset of the interview, Lisa, you and, and I alluded to it uh, soon thereafter, you began your time with the organization just prior to uh, much of the team going into quarantine. And I, I wonder what lessons you have drawn, lessons of leadership, lessons of collaboration, frankly, you know, the extent to which you probably to a certain extent were still finding your way and onboarding yourself uh, in those early days and having to do so uh, virtually to, to at least some extent. Talk a bit about some of the learnings of those early days and how that's uh, further impacted the way in which you've thought about interactions with your team um, as, as time has gone on. Yeah, absolutely. I was with the company uh, two weeks before we recognized that we were going to need to move completely to remote work. And we were able to do that over a four-day weekend with the help of our business partners to move everyone in the company, 7,000 people, to be able to work from home. And that was an incredible feat for the IT organization and the teams to make that happen with zero operational impact, frankly, on our members. And, you know, I reflect a lot, Peter, on I am creating significant change and transformation in the organization not only have I had to ramp virtually into the company, but I've been hiring a leadership team. I've been infusing new talent uh, into the organization, have hired almost 150 new employees into the IT organization in order to support uh, the vision that we have. And that has all had to be done virtually uh, in terms of how do I continue to lead and support the organization? And one of the things that I definitely recognize is it requires what I call authentic leadership. And when I say authentic leadership uh, during this pandemic, that it was really necessary for all leaders, frankly, not just new to the company, to, to listen more, to understand where our employees were at, to understand the capacity for change that they could handle to be connected to what all of our employees were dealing with. And what I love about Blue Shield of California is that we always keep our employees front and center. And one of the things that I took from our CEO is that at every leadership meeting or all manager meeting, 
we say first and foremost, are you taking care of yourselves? Second, are you taking care of your families? And third, what then can you contribute to the mission of Blue Shield of California? And I think acting in that order and supporting our employees and the organization has never been more important and requires that authenticity and engagement as a leader to understand where your team is and what you can do to support them. Second of all, as you're leading transformational change, um, it requires communication, of course. But now when you're in a virtual environment and really our only channel is the channel through Zoom or WebEx um, to get creative and doing videos and doing coffee chats and the need to over communicate, you know, and I'm a firm believer that you can never communicate enough. So that engagement and trying to stay connected, keep the video on, try to find that connection with the employees has been extremely important in navigating this change. And of course, in in leading transformational change, having that executive buy-in, having that close foundational support and trust with your business partners. This This isn't about a change in IT. This is about a business change and a change within the company uh, in terms of what we're trying to do at Blue Shield of California. So all of those things are incredibly important. And you have to lead that change. You have to uh, take agency to lead the change for the organization and continue to navigate and persevere. Because we know this type of change as you're moving to a portfolio product model, as you're thinking about uh, now leveraging agile methodologies and having an agile mindset, um, that requires perseverance. It's a journey. Doesn't happen overnight to create that mindset shift that we want to create through the company, uh, to think about things differently of how we leverage technology to support our mission and vision. Uh, So you're in it for the long haul. Great overview. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yours has been such a fascinating career. You spent uh, more than 25 years in government, uh, multiple stops as a chief information officer in the government sector. Uh, you were uh, at the at Georgetown University as chief information officer, so an academic CIO uh, as well. You spent time at Intel, uh, first in technology. You ran a $9 billion business there, uh, worked directly with the various chief information officers and technology leaders across that organization prior to taking your current post. And I wonder, I mean, it's rare, I mean, I speak with uh, a great number of your peers as technology digital um, CXOs, and rare is it for me to find somebody who has had as diverse an array of experiences as yours. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Oftentimes, people are pigeonholed as government CIOs, as academic CIOs, or choose never to leave the private sector um, you know, as, as technology leaders. Talk a bit about, if you would, uh, in brief, uh, we could we could spend the entire time talking about your your uh, very uh, fruitful uh, career and your many stops. But talk a bit about some of the threads that you've pulled across this diverse array of experiences and what the some of the commonalities across those various stops have have taught you uh, about being an effective uh, technology executive. Uh, thank thank you, Peter. You know, one of the the beautiful things about being a technology leader is no matter what sector that you're in, our challenges are all pretty much the same. Now we all address those technology opportunities at a different place, at a different maturity level. Our stakeholders are clearly different, but the technology opportunities and how we leverage technology to support mission or business outcomes doesn't change. And certainly the benefit of having the diversity of perspective in my career has given me the experience and the knowledge of how to take all of those learnings and apply them now to the role that I am in helping to transform healthcare, which is one of the reasons I uh, came to Blue Shield of California was to have an impact to work for a mission-focused company and to order to drive change in probably one of the most important sectors that I believe that there is. And I've had the opportunity to work in all of them, uh, certainly in my role at Intel. And I've always approached each of those roles as an opportunity for new growth and learning. 
So certainly spending 26 years in the Department of Defense, incredible experience around mission focus, uh, being at the tip of the spear in supporting the warfighter or supporting uh, law enforcement gave me very unique perspective uh, and sought out an opportunity to have a different perspective as I decided to take the role once I retired from government as the CIO at Georgetown University. Incredible experience, 180 degrees opposite in terms of consensus-driven leadership, the students being front and center as digital natives and creating a transformation strategy uh, for Georgetown University around technology. And then of course, seeking out additional learning of being in high tech of working at Intel with the very unique role that Intel plays in the ecosystem of being agnostic and a partner and having a global and managing a global business. Um, all of those have brought me unique learnings and experience that frankly, I believe makes me a better CIO. Uh, certainly much more informed, much more experienced and the wisdom to bring those experience to help shape and move and impact the healthcare industry. That's fantastic. You know, it strikes me, Lisa, just as I'm thinking about it, another commonality, at least across some of your steps, is you've worked in organizations that have a complexity of a customer, if you will. Uh, you know, when you were in DOD, you had the the people who were um, fighting on, on our behalf. You had a variety of constituent groups within government that you were serving. Uh, in the academic sector, you've got the, the academics themselves, that is the professors and the administrators across a, a vast world-class university, ultimately the customer of the students themselves, to some extent their parents, I suppose, as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, likewise, now in healthcare, as you, as you talked about, of course, at the end of the day, it's the patients, but you talked about the payers and, you know, the various providers and so on uh, that 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 make up this ecosystem as well. You've worked in several different environments where you need to think in multiple dimensions in terms of the value that you're contributing. Is that a is that a fair assessment? So, so many of your peers will have a you know a a, a singular customer uh, that they are focused on, and you know for better or for worse, certainly a simpler perhaps one might argue than than the added complexity of multiple layers of those those constituent groups you need to bear in mind. Talk a bit about how that's oriented the way in which you've thought about things. Yeah, I, I think, Peter, that's absolutely uh, correct. The stakeholders at which I support. First, I would say I seek opportunities where transformation is sought after and where that diversity and complex complexity in the stakeholder community um, is there. And it's one of the things that I really love doing is relationship building, collaboration building, team building in order to find the win-win in order to move an organization or a mission or a company forward. So I, I certainly seek out those roles at which to do that. And one of the things I've thought about a lot, even in my role here at healthcare is the similarities of those stakeholder engagements and communities as I engage in my new role here as the CIO of Blue Shield. For example, data interoperability and sharing. This was a continual issue we engaged with in the intelligence community, if you think about after 9-11. How do we continue to improve data sharing and data interoperability so that we were acting off all of the same information? You know, of course, the mission then was to, the outcome was to catch the bad actors uh, in terms of what we were trying to do. But now bring that into healthcare. You know, one of the biggest challenges that we have in healthcare is data sharing and interoperability. And there are so many different constituents and takehold stakeholders that have a view or a role as to why that should happen or not happen. So um, how we solve that problem and move the industry forward is very similar to challenges that I dealt with when I was working in Department of Defense. And, you know, one other example that I'll give is, you know, Blue Shield of California has had the honor to work with the state of California and helping to accelerate vaccine to all Californians. And many of my peers had never had the experience of working with government before state governments. And of course, oh yes, 
I've had this experience. I'm having a deja vu moment with my 26 years in federal government of how do you find and build coalitions and partnerships in order to meet the mission and solve for the bigger problem that we we all have the same goal. How we want to get there and solve for that goal is where those coalitions and partnership building become so important. That's a great overview. You also are a board member, uh, Chief Information Officer, a growing uh, club, so to say, of, of your peers. Uh, still elite, but but growing, thankfully. You're on the board of Mirantis, among other organizations, Mirantis being a B2B open source cloud computing software and services company. Talk a bit about the the pathway to becoming a board level uh, Chief Information Officer and and perhaps with a little bit of advice for those who might wish to follow in your footsteps. Uh, yes, I, I've had the ability to serve certainly with Morantis. I've done a lot of nonprofit boards. I've been done on advisory committees. And currently I'm serving on the board of trustees for the uh, Blue Shield of California Foundation, hmm. which really focuses on health equity and ending domestic violence. And, and really my advice would be uh, being on a board requires a lot of time and commitment. And I always recommend, uh, certainly as I'm talking to other leaders, is to find a board of where you're passionate about, where their focus is, um, because you're going to be spending time there. And I think a great way to get experience is to start on those advisory committees and those nonprofit boards. It's a great learning opportunity to understand Uh, how to best support and serve as a board member. Um, They're not quite as time consuming as a for-profit board uh, is. And it's a great way to build and create a stepping stone into more board appointments. So that would be my my first counsel. And then it's about networking. Uh, certainly even myself, as I think about other corporate board appointments and something I'm very interested in, in doing, but I'm also very cognizant of my time availability and the commitment that I can give to those boards. But uh, networking, certainly leveraging executive search firms. And one of the beautiful things here in California is the requirement to have women on the board Um, I believe the date is by 2022, uh, it is a law. So creating that diversity and equity at the board level, uh, certainly very exciting to see what California is doing. And even at Blue Shield of California, Peter, we have our first female board chair in the history of the company that I'm very proud of. We have 50% equity on the board for Blue Shield of California. And we also have 50% equity of men and women in the executive ranks at Blue Shield of California. So one of the things I'm most excited about, frankly, of being in healthcare is I've seen more women in the executive ranks and I see us at Blue Shield of California really being the role model of how we should be thinking about not only from a board perspective, but also a le- executive leadership perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. I wanted to ask you about that. As somebody who has success, successfully navigated uh, her way to the the top of, of technology in so many different organizations, uh, and, and in the early stages of your career, uh, having done so at a time, especially when when it was even rarer, uh, kind of your own thought process about the state of the union of women. Sounds like enormous progress that your organization has has made. And uh, as you point out, there there are uh, state regulations among other other ways in which uh, further progress may be driven. Um, talk a bit about this as somebody who, uh, you know, a CIO Hall of Famer and uh, somebody who has been recognized uh, as a top 100 woman in technology by Technology Magazine, uh, among other, a- other accolades that you have received. Uh, talk a bit about your own thought process about uh, how the next generation might be brought up uh, to follow in your footsteps. You know, I started, Peter, as a computer engineering uh, undergrad at Syracuse University, where I was one of just a couple young women in a class of several hundred men uh, in my computer engineering class. And frankly, throughout my entire career in Department of Defense, in academia, and in high tech, continued to be the only woman in the room. Um, 
And this is one of the things that, frankly, I'm I'm most excited about as I look around uh, at my peers in healthcare to see more women uh, in the executive ranks. But we are we are far from done, and unfortunately, in the pandemic, we have lost four times as many women to the workplace as we have men. Uh, because of the many roles um, that we as women play in keeping our families together and certainly with our children being out of school and trying to manage all that and aging parents. Um, So we are actually losing women uh, in STEM. We've been taking several steps backwards. And I think the latest statistic is, is it will take us almost another 257 years to make up Uh, what we have lost in terms of women's leadership and women in the STEM field. So we have much work to do. Uh, Certainly, I feel it is my job um, as an executive leader to bring as many women forward as possible to be a role model. I also recognize having worked in uh, bringing women and young girls into STEM, that it must start with building the pipeline that usually starts in middle school when we know we lose our girls to STEM fields and then it continues to the high school and then they're not ready when they get to college to prepare to take on these STEM majors. So it requires all of us to reach back, pull others forward, Um, to engage in building that pipeline for the future uh, so that we can have that diversity uh, that is much needed in uh, the technology field today. Great thoughts all, Lisa. Thank you so much. Uh, Last area that I wanted to cover with you are just sort of some trends that excite you as you look to the future. You've talked about a number of them that you're already leveraging as part of your current experience, but wanted to circle back and see if there's anything else as you look, uh, you know, let's say two or three years into the future, some of the things that are beginning to make their way onto your roadmap that particularly excite you. Well, I'd have to start with data and analytics. Uh, Certainly that's not new and exciting. We've been talking about this for years now, but what we're doing in healthcare with the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're just starting uh, to leverage that capability of what we can do and how we can shape the healthcare industry. So continued efforts uh, in data and analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning is critical. I think of robotics, robotic process automation, and some of the in, inroads and incredible innovation that is happening in robotics to help in the medical field and in surgeries. I also think as we look two to three years out, and certainly this is work that we've started and think about at Intel Corporation is quantum computing and how quantum computing will change the face of how we problem solve. Certainly, as we think about the pandemic, uh, these issues that have affected us globally and how we think for, solve for, model for, um, and be ready uh, for any type, goodness gracious, it doesn't happen again, but um, uh, a next global crisis that we may have to endure. So I think quantum computing can play a huge uh, role in that. So, so much exciting development as technology continues to just grow in leaps and bounds. What I'm most excited about is having the healthcare industry uh, leverage that technology to ultimately keep improving that experience and moving our healthcare, creating that technical revolution I talked about earlier. Uh, to create a healthcare system worthy of our family and friends that's digital, that improves our health outcomes, and ultimately creates that digital experience that we know our members are craving for. Mm. Well, Lisa Davis, thank you so much for, for joining me today on Technovation. It's great, been great to hear uh, a very variety of aspects of your experience as a seasoned technology executive across so many different types of organizations, the great work your, your team and you are doing uh, in arguably the most important sector, especially these days. Uh, um, congratulations on your, your successes, and, and thank you so much for uh, helping me shine a bit of a light on, on the great work that you and your team are doing. Thank you, Peter. I really appreciate the opportunity, and it's been a pleasure to chat with you today. Wonderful.